Hi, everybody, and welcome to an introduction to veterinary immunology. This is part of our online continuing education course for you guys, and uh, I am Dr. Emily Reiner. Some of you might remember me from the end of your course last year, and I'm happy to be back here to teach you about immunology, and of course you'll be hearing from me on some other topics as well. So here we go, and I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. Immunology is fascinating. So first, some key points about the immune system. Its role is to protect animals against microbial invasion. So you can imagine how important that is, because if we had no defense against microbial invasion, well, it wouldn't take long for us to die. So um, that's why I really like immunology. It's fascinating, and it's really what keeps us alive. Well, I guess among other things. <laughs> so there are lots of mechanisms involved here, three primarily. One of them is physical barriers. So this is our first line of defense against uh, invading microbes. So we're going to talk about these in more detail on the following slides. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview right now. So number one, uh, physical barriers. Uh, number two is innate immunity. So this is a rapid initial protection against invaders. And uh, the most significant example of this is the inflammatory response. So say you're bitten by a mosquito or something and then that spot turns red pretty much right away and might swell up a bit. That would be an example of an inflammatory response that's uh, caused by the innate immune system. Thirdly, there's the adapt adaptive immunity. So adaptive immunity is long-term immunity. It can remember prior exposure to invaders and as a result, it can actually respond really quickly to subsequent exposures. So this is very, very important, and we're going to go into some detail on this, uh, but not enough to make you too uh, confused, at least I hope. <laughs> so there are two forms of adaptive immunity. One involves antibodies, and those are proteins that circulate in the body fluids uh, and the bloodstream. They bind to bacteria and they mark them for destruction. And not just bacteria, any pathogen that's invading the body. They'll bind to it and they'll basically let the body know that these need to be destroyed. There's also cell-mediated immunity, and this part of the immune system involves cells that destroy abnormal cells, so cells that are infected by a virus or, again, a bacteria or something like that. So that's cell-mediated immunity. Just some more notes on immunity here. Um, the failure of the immune system to defend against invaders will result in disease and possibly death. So an example of this would be, for instance, uh, foals can be born with something called severe combined immunodeficiency, and that's also known as SCID. These foals are born essentially with no immune system, and as you can imagine, it doesn't take them very long to succumb to infection and die, so it's really, it's a really sad, a really awful condition. And uh, so that's an example of when, you know, a case where the immune system never develops and doesn't function. Um, another way the immune system can be compromised is if it's essentially destroyed, like in the case of AIDS, um, or potentially because the invaders are able to overcome the body's defenses. So if someone dies of a severe infection, it's not to say that they don't have an immune system that's working, it's just that the, the immune system was not able to fight off that particular pathogen, at least not quickly enough to, to save the, the animal. So a couple of definitions here. First of all, a pathogen. A pathogen is any organism that can cause disease. Virulence is the pathogenic microorganism's ability to invade the body and cause disease. So a pathogen that's highly virulent is more able to cause disease. It has a greater ability to do it and um, so you're more likely to actually see illness with, with those pathogens. And the immune system, as we've mentioned, is the body's defense. It involves interacting networks of biochemicals and cellular reactions. And we will not talk too much about the biochemistry here, but we'll, we'll talk about the cells and, and how they work and how they respond. So we're going to go into uh, a little bit more detail on some of the um, mechanisms whereby the immune system is able to exert its effect. So first of all, the physical barriers. F 
Physical barriers are the body's first line of defense. So the most obvious one would be skin. So if skin is damaged, microbes will invade. Well, that's pretty obvious. So if we get a cut or something like that, one of the first things that we usually do is we wash it out. And why do we do that? Well, we do that to help decrease the number of pathogens that are gonna have the opportunity to get past our first line of defense into our body. So we'll wash it up, maybe we'll put a little polysporin on it. And what's that? Well, that's an antibiotic. So we're trying to already stop those pathogens because we know that once our skin is no longer intact, then we are susceptible to infections. And then maybe we'll put a band-aid on top to act kind of like skin for a little while until it heals. So we already know almost innately that our skin is so important in defending us against pathogens. Uh, and, and we will respond uh, in that way in order to make sure to, to keep that defense intact. And it's another, another type of physical barrier is kind of like the self-cleaning processes that go on in the respiratory tract, tract and the GI tract. So it's important to remember that the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract are actually open to the outside of the body, just like the skin. So we're kind of built like a tube and the gastrointestinal tract kind of runs down the middle of the tube and it's actually exposed to the environment just like our skin. Um, the respiratory tract, similarly, we breathe in and out so it's constantly in, exposed to the air. So these systems need uh, a way of cleaning themselves and protecting themselves against invaders. So in these cases, so the respiratory tract, for instance, coughing and sneezing are going to help to expel pathogens from the body before they can get into the bloodstream. Mucus flow, again, if you've ever been sick, you know how much mucus that you make. You're blowing your nose all the time. Why is that? Well, we're trying to get rid of those pathogens that are trying to take take up residence in our nasal passages and that sort of thing. Um, vomiting and diarrhea, of course, gastrointestinal tract it actually, it actually um, has this reaction which involves vomiting and diarrhea to pathogens. So it's not just that you have vomiting and diarrhea, you know, it's, it's not just an unpleasant experience. There's actually a functionality to it. Uh, it so the body is trying to get rid of, of pathogens and, and uh, clean itself out. So there we go. Those are our physical barriers. Here's our second line of defense. This is innate immunity. So say a microorganism gets past the epithelium, it hopefully will only last a few hours before the body's able to eliminate it. Uh, harmful bacteria and viruses differ structurally and chemically from normal animal tissues. So our bodies take advantage of this and they identify those pathogens and those invaders that are what we call non-self and get rid of them. So, animals make molecules that kill those invaders directly or, again, they can promote the destruction of the invaders by defensive cells. So these molecules can be continuously circulating in the animal or they're created upon stimulation by a microbe. So we're gonna go into more detail on this. Don't worry much about it right now. But do remember that the innate immune system lacks any memory. This is really important. So each episode is dealt with identically. So your body comes into contact with bacteria A and it will mount a, an innate immune response, which involves a lot of different white blood cells and things like that. Um, you're gonna get some inflammation with it. And, uh, and then the, the adaptive immune system may have to take over and, uh, and actually eliminate it if, if the innate immune system is not able to do that. But, if your body were to come into contact with bacteria A again down the road, it would not change the way it reacts to bacteria A. So it would, again, just, um, it would just, you'd send those white blood cells, the same ones it would have sent before, uh, and they would do their thing and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully prevent infection of the body with this organism. So subsequent exposures are all dealt with the same way. There's no memory. The adaptive immune system is the one that has memory, and we're going to go into that. Again, the 
An example of innate immunity, or the prime example, is inflammation. All right, now let me see if I can find my little laser pointer here. Ooh, there it is. So, innate immunity. It's a rapid response. So this is why this is a great thing to have, is that we have this rapid response. Our body has all these cells in circulation, and or sometimes in the tissues just close to the skin and things like that. And our body can send all these cells to the site of possible infection. So these cells are things like macrophages and mast cells, basophils, eosinophils, um, and then helper T cells and natural killer cells. So we'll talk more about these. But basically white blood cells are going to go to the area where there's a possible invader and they're just going to start attacking. That's the innate immune response. Here's our adaptive immune response over here. It involves B cells and T cells, two kinds of lymphocytes. We're not going to worry about those right away. But just try to remember that helper T cells and natural killer cells are also actually involved in adaptive immunity. So the next slide is going to just show you uh, a, a little bit in, in a little bit more detail of the innate immune system. It will just describe that to you in video form. So I'll send you on over to the next slide and I'll catch you on the flip side. Hi you guys. So we're back today to talk about the immune system. We spent uh, a little bit of the last lecture on blood talking about the immune system. We talked about blood typing. And it was kind of a nice introduction to the immune system because we talked about antigens and how antigens are basically any substance that can stimulate an immune response. And we had a little bit of conversation about antibodies as well. So we'll see more from antibodies in this lecture and the next lecture, but there are two branches of the immune system. And the bottom line with the immune system, not surprising at all, it's identifying and attacking non-self, you. <laughs> and the immune system will take care of that for you. So there are two branches of the immune system, and today we're going to talk about one of them. It's the innate immune system. And tomorrow, or whatever day it is, we're going to talk about the acquired. And I'm just going to do a really quick uh, compare and contrast. Both and carry out strategies to kill non-self. The innate immune system, however, is present from birth. That means you come out of your mama's belly ready to attack things that aren't you. Acquired immune system, you have to, where'd that thing come from? Doing weird things. The acquired immune system is acquired. I'm not even going to write that down because it requires time to get the strategies that are employed with the acquired immune response. The innate immune response is fast. Guess what the acquired immune response is? Slow. The acquired immune response has memory which means even though it's slow, there is a memory that allows it to um, basically hang on to strategies. It took time to develop the strategy to attack the bad guy, but uh, once you have the strategy, then you're going to remember it and you can attack that bad guy again. Um, and along those lines, the acquired immune response is very, very specific. And what that means is that a, a bad guy, an antigen, something that stimulates the immune response, is the acquired to a very specific antigen. So basically there's like a million different possible responses, and each part of the acquired immune response is only going to respond to one antigen and only that one specific antigen, whereas the innate immune response is totally general. So it has like, I don't know, five strategies, not a million, five. And it uses the same strategy against all the bad guys. 
So one of the strategies is inflammation. And we're going to spend the first inflammation. We're going to spend the first chunk of this lecture talking about inflammation. What is it? And at why is it? But it's a very generalized response to an invader. Acquired immune response is much more specific than that. Um, I think that's pretty good overview. So let's talk about inflammation because it's actually really cool. We're going to move on. Um, we're going to move on and talk about NK cells for a minute. But first, before I do that, I just want to introduce you to this website called Immense Immunology Insight. I love this website. I think that it is hilarious. And it's got a lot of cartoons and stuff, and I'll show you some more of them. Um, but they, they really explain immunity really well. So if you're interested in this topic or if you're having trouble understanding what the heck I'm talking about, I do recommend that you go to the Immense Immunology Insight website. It is fun and it is really easy to understand. So these, it has a series of these cards. They're like player cards, like, like, like baseball cards, but they're for each of the immune cells. Um, these aren't the most easy to understand, but um, they're kind of funny, so I included this one here. So NK cells, natural killer cells, can recognize stressed cells without antibodies or antigen-presenting cells. So that's really cool. They automatically can say, hey, that cell doesn't look right. I'm going to go ahead and just kill it. So that's kind of neat. So what does it do? It recognizes antigen combined with class 1 MHC. So don't worry about class 1 MHC. It's just basically a platform on the surface of the cell that shows what antigen it's got inside. Don't worry about it. And just know that these are altered cell cells. So these natural killer cells can recognize these altered or abnormal cell cells. They get signals to activate. So um, from, from other from other cells, usually T helper cells and that sort of thing, will send these basically these chemicals along to the natural killer cell and say, hey, yeah, go ahead and kill this thing that you've recognized that's not normal. So just know that they do have activation signals. And then what they do once they've been activated and they found something they want to kill, they release cytotoxic proteins. So they release, release perforin and granzymes. Don't worry about what's what and their names. Just know that they basically poke holes into cells, and then the cells die. So pretty cool. Adaptive immunity. All right. So now we're getting into the part of the immune system that has memory. Really cool. So the adaptive immune system can recognize and, and destroy invaders and learn from the process. So again, if an animal encounters the same organism a second time, the adaptive immune system will respond more rapidly and effectively. So the more often the individual encounters an invader, the more effective the immune defense becomes. Really, really handy. So if you think about this, this is like when you were a kid and you were in daycare or whatever, and you got like 500 colds a year and drove your parents crazy. Well, the reason that you don't get so many now, you might get one or two, is that your adaptive immune response to those organisms is ready to go. You've been exposed to them enough times that your body's going to take care of them before you ever get sick. So adaptive immunity is really great. It's also, by the way, called acquired immunity. So those two terms are used interchangeably, and I may use them interchangeably. interchangeably so just know if it starts with an A, we're talking about the part of the immune system with memory. It takes several days to weeks to become effective. So that's why we have our primary and secondary lines of defense, our skin, our physical barriers, right? And then our innate immunity. Loss of adaptive immunity leads to uncontrolled infections and death. So you can imagine if your, your primary defense fails, which can happen in lots of cases, and your innate immunity can't get rid of an organism, if you don't have that adaptive immunity to back, it, to back you up and defend you, you could be in serious trouble. So that's the sort of thing that will happen with AIDS patients um, who are not able to produce the immune cells they need to produce. They don't have the active, effective adaptive immunity and uh, they will eventually 
a lot of them succumb to infection. So this is kind of neat. I'm going to get my laser pointer out here again. Uh, so this is just sort of like a timeline. I really like looking at things visually like this. So here we have a microbe trying to get through the skin and it gets through, say it gets through the epithelial barriers. Oh, hi, sorry folks, I had to take a phone call. Uh, but here we are back uh, talking about the the defense timeline here. So basically we're looking at the microbes who get past these epithelial barriers sometimes and then we have our innate immunity which uh, takes basically minutes to hours uh, and to have its effect. So over the first few hours we've got the innate immunity trying to take care of things. The adaptive immune system can kick in as early as a couple of days if it's ready to go, or it can take, you know, it can take weeks in some cases. So if we look at our little timeline down here, we, right away we have the physical barriers doing their thing when we're exposed to, to a, an invader. And then shortly thereafter our innate immunity kicks in and within minutes to hours again it peaks in terms of activity and then it slowly tapers off as the acquired immunity comes in to really take care of things. So that's how that goes. Pretty neat. And this is just a picture of some dendritic cells uh, hanging on to a cell that they think needs to be eliminated. Alright, so invaders can be classified into two categories. So there are organisms that originate outside the body, so most bacteria do fungi, many of the protozoans and helminths. So this the defense in these cases is directed against extracellular invaders, so invaders that are hanging out outside of cells. This is also called an exogenous immunity. So uh, in this type of immunity, antibodies are used to promote the destruction of invaders. It's also called the humoral immune response because antibodies are in body bodily fluids or humor. So humor is an old old word for bodily fluids. So humoral immunity, antibodies. That's what you need to remember. Also outside the cell. Organism inside, so if there's an organism inside the body cells, so that would include viruses, intracellular bacteria, protozoans, that sort of thing, um, then the de defense is directed against intracellular invaders. So this is endogenous immunity. There are special cells that destroy the infected or abnormal cells because antibodies obviously are not going to work inside the cell. They don't go through the membrane, they're not going to work inside the cell, so now we have cells that recognize affected cells and destroy them. This is also called cell-mediated immune response. So the cell-mediated immune response obviously involves the killing of cells, the humoral immune response involves the killing of of just the invaders themselves. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the concept of vaccines, and this is an example of passive vaccination. So if there's one horse that was vaccinated against tetanus or who had recovered from the disease, that horse will carry antibodies for the virus in its serum. Now if you take that horse's serum, you inject it into another non-immune horse, so a horse that's never seen tetanus before, the second horse will have temporary resistance against tetanus. So in this case the tetanus toxin is an example of a foreign substance that stimulates adaptive immunity. The term for the substance is an antigen. Antibodies are specific only to the antigen that stimulated their production. So this is really important. So it, a tetanus antibody is created by the presence of tetanus antigens. Those antibodies that were created will only ever be able to be used against tetanus and no other invader. The adaptive immune response is extremely specific. It's very cool that way. When the antibody binds to the specific antigen that it's designed to bind to, that antibody will neutralize the pathogen and protect the animal from it. Let's talk for a minute here about boosters. So we all know we give the first vaccine. So say we're talking about puppies. They come in at eight weeks and you give them the first vaccine, which is which contains you know a small amount of toxin or antigen or a harmful invader or whatever it is. 
it takes a few days or several days for the antibodies to actually form. This is called the lag period. And eventually when they appear, the number of antibodies will climb, 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 and then reach a peak at about 10 to 20 days and will start to decline after that. They will disappear entirely in a few weeks. So the protection from the first vaccine is quite small, but it's called the primary immune response. So now we come back, say three to four weeks later, that's usually how long we wait between vaccines. The second dose is given. Now the lag period is only about two to three days, and then the antibodies will, in the serum, will rise more rapidly and to a higher level. And then they'll decrease much more slowly than, than they did the first time. So that's the secondary immune response. And then for some vaccines, we'll give a third dose. In those cases, we'll have an even shorter lag period, an even higher and more pro prolonged antibody response. And those antibodies are now better able to kill the pathogens. So you can see the importance of booster vaccine, booster vaccinations. So, you know, a lot of owner, owners think we just want to get their money, but actually, no, we want to protect their animals from these pathogens. And that's why we bring them back two and three times, just to make sure that we get that initial immunity. And then we can start boostering every year or two or three, depending on the vaccine. So let's look at important cells in adaptive immunity. So the appropriate immune response, i.e. antibody mediated versus cell mediated, it's triggered by cells that initially will actually trap and process the antigen itself and present it to cells of the immune system that can recognize it. Those are antigen produce, sorry, antigen presenting cells or APCs. So before anything else happens, basically certain cells will kind of gobble up these antigens, take fragments of, of the DNA or some part of that antigen and stick it on the cell surface. So uh, just to, to show it basically to other Im immune cells. The cells that recognize the antigen and respond appropriately are lymphocytes called B cells. Those are involved in the humoral response and T cells, which are involved in the cell mediated response. So B cells and T cells are two kinds of lymphocytes. B cells produce antibodies and T cells are involved in cell mediated immunity. So those are important things to know. Each of these cells has a specific receptor on the cell surface that will bind and recognize specific antigens and create the desired immune reaction to those antigens. These lymphocytes are considered memory cells, so they can cause a secondary immune response. I'm just going to show you a little bit here. Um, so this, is, this is a picture of humoral immunity. So basically, we'll say these are maybe antigens sticking out on the cell surface, and here's our Y-shaped molecules called antibodies coming to bind to the surface uh, of this cell. So that's one way we can do it. Or you know, um, uh, this could potentially be, I'm not sure what the picture is supposed to be, to be honest, so so maybe this is a cell that's producing antibodies, but either way it looks cool, which is really the point here. <laughs> but here's an example of humoral response and how that actually works. So first of all, say we have a virus that's invaded the body, um, antibodies are going to come along, specific antibodies that have already been produced against this virus, they're going to bind to the vir virus surface. So what that means is the virus itself, a lot of viruses like to kind of um, fuse with the membrane of the cell and then kind of release their DNA or RNA or whatever in, into the cell and uh, start replicating. But in a case like this, when the virus has been coated by antibodies, it is it can't fuse with the cell. So it kind of like bounces off the cell membrane and it's like adios virus. And then it's kind of floating around free in the bloodstream. And then a macrophage or something will come along and eat it up because the macrophage says, wait a minute, this is something that's coated by antibodies, which means the body doesn't want it. So, hey, I'll just eat it up and get rid of it. It's pretty cool, really. Okay, so here's some more cartoons from that website that I talked about. Uh, I love these. So this is just to clarify a couple of things about the immune system. So first let's talk about antigen presentation. So here we go. We have, we'll call this a, well, it's a dendritic cell, meaning it's a cell that has all kinds of like arms coming off of it. So this is a phagocyte. So it's going to eat something. So it's going to eat a bacterium in this case. And parts of that bacteria 
are going to, you know, basically the bacteria is in here inside the cell. It's getting digested and then the parts of it, parts of the, some of the antigens from the bacteria are going to go to the cell surface. The phagocytes will then find a helper T cell or somehow interact with a helper T cell. The helper T cell is going to say, hey, I recognize this antigen. It's no good. We want to get rid of it. And the helper T cell becomes activated. And so here we go. We have an activated helper T cell that's going to recognize this particular antigen. So now moving on, what, how does the humoral immune response work? So now we have a B cell that's found this bacteria, this one right here, say. It's found the same bacteria. It's found the antigen. And um, so it, he's going to go ahead and talk with the helper T cell. So this is the helper T cell that's already been activated over here. Um, this guy was bound this bacteria, so he's act he wants to be activated. He talks to the helper T cell. The helper T cell basically says, hey, yeah, go ahead. Let's destroy this guy. So now this B cell becomes activated. Do, 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 moving on over here. The activated B cell actually divides into plasma cells and memory cells. Plasma cells are the active responders um, in the humoral immune response. And then memory cells are obviously there to remember this antigen for the next time the body encounters it. So here's our active plasma cell, which is just a B cell that has differentiated into a plasma cell, and it starts spitting out antibodies to this exact bacteria that, that was found up here and right here. So the plasma cells produce these antibodies. The antibodies start attaching to the bacteria that we're worried about, and then a lovely phagocyte comes along, eats up this bacteria because it's been marked with these antigens, or sorry, antibodies, and uh, eliminates it from the body. And then the memory cell kind of hangs out, and then if it happens to encounter the same antigen again, so it's the same bacteria comes back again, the memory cell is all ready to go. So it's immediately going to remember this and start back here again. It's pretty cool. The whole immune thing, it's just, it's just amazing to me. So just a quick note on cell-mediated immune response. Um, this response destroys any cell in the animal's body that shows any kind of abnormality. So let's just go through this little picture. What's the word I'm looking for? Diagram here. So we've got our macrophage here, and this macrophage is it's got all these little antigens on the surface. So it's it's trying to show, it's, pr it's basically trying to activate this T cell by showing it all these antigens that it's come in contact with. Here, now we have this T cell has been turned into a helper T cell because it's been activated. The helper T cell goes ahead and talks to T cells and B cells, but in this case we'll talk about the T cells. So it talks to killer T cells, so it activates killer T cells. And killer T cells, what they do is they go find an infected cell. So this, this cell has the same antigens on its surface as this, ac this macrophage did. So this is an infected cell because it's got those antigens on the surface. The killer T cell has been activated by the helper T cell, so it recognizes those antigens, and it's going to go ahead and start poking holes in the cell membrane and killing it. So basically, the takeaway message here is that Again, T helper cells, just like with with the humoral immune response, in the cell mediated immune response, T helper cells, again, are used to kind of act as a check. Like, are we going to go ahead and kill this cell? Are we sure we want to do that? Well, the helper cell is going to come along, talk to that T cell and say, yes, we are going to do that. All right, so just another note on adaptive immunity. The immune response itself doesn't depend just on the animal's immunity. We also need to take into consideration the invaded, invading microbe. What is it? How does it work? Its virulence, its ability to evade or escape defenses, and its interaction with other microbes. These are all factors that will affect how well our immune system works against any particular pathogen. So what I'm going to do is just allow you to watch a video um, by these guys that do, they're called Crash Course 
I don't know, they're like crash course video series online and they're pretty excellent. So there's crash, crash course biology, which is kind of my favorite. And um, this one explains basic immunity really, really well. So I'm going to let you watch that. It's going to summarize everything for you and hopefully take away any questions that you have. Uh, and I'll be back uh, uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as you're done with this. So I'll see you in a little bit. Sex and not dying. That's what biology is all about. And while the sex part is, I'll grant you, a little bit sexier, not dying is also really fantastic. Something that I personally like to do every single day. I personally like to not die in all sorts of ways, like I don't jump out of planes, I don't go into active combat zones, I don't do heroin. I can, however, spend time wallowing in the filth with my cute bacon producing friends here and not have to worry about dying. If somehow my body can handle a lot of little devils on my hands and my air and my food, little things that literally want to kill me. There are more potential human killers in this pig pen than there are in all of the world's prisons, but I don't have to worry about it because of an elite team of microscopic assassins that live inside my body, my immune system. Ah, that was really close to my hand. You've heard of some of these little ninjas, others maybe not, but everyone knows the work they do by the trail of dead that they leave behind. Pus being the most disgusting example. And the work that these guys do is pretty hardcore. They not only identify incoming enemies, they eliminate them, and then they keep files on them in case their kind ever comes back. So I don't want to freak you out, but you uh, and I are covered in pathogens right now, and you really can't blame them for wanting to get a piece of your action. You warm, high energy, nutrient rich, salty, watery action. Your body's pretty much a theme park for these guys and although the majority of organisms living inside you actually make your life more comfy, there are some less helpful viruses and organisms from here on out referred to as pathogens that will want to turn your body into a factory for their children. So let's avoid that. We have two basic ways of doing it, innate or non-specific immunity that responds to all kinds of pathogens the same way and very quickly whether your body has seen that pathogen before or not, and your acquired or adaptive immunity which develops more slowly and requires your body to learn the wily ways of the pathogen before it defeats it. Every animal has an innate immune system, even sponges, but only vertebrates have the acquired kind. You were born with your innate immune system, and from the second that you wiggled your way out of the sterile environment of your mom and into this germy, disgusting world, that system has been protecting you. The thing about the innate immune system is that it doesn't care what it's killing. It doesn't worry about whether it's offing a virus or a bacteria or a fungus. Its job is to just keep the enemy from getting in. Or, once it's in, to sneak up behind it and break its neck ninja style. The first line of defense in keeping sketchy characters out are the skin and mucous membranes. The skin has so many excellent functions, like keeping your organs in, that it's easy to forget that its primary purpose is to keep things out. It's oily and kind of acidic and really not easy to penetrate, and I'm about to rock your world with this but your digestive tract is also technically the outside of you. Remember how our bodies are basically just built around a tube, right? Well, the inside of that tube is exposed to as much weird grody stuff as the outside of the tube. So your body treats the digestive tract like the front lines of this war, which is one of the reasons why your stomach takes no prisoners with the whole stomach acid situation. In addition to things like skin, we've also got mucous membranes providing another barrier to microbes trying to sneak in. Mucous membranes line all of your internal surfaces that are exposed to the outside side like your lungs and the inside of your nose as well as some other parts of your body like the inside of your mouth and your eyelids and your sex organs. Mucous membranes unsurprisingly produce mucus which is a viscous fluid, you've probably heard of it, and it traps microbes and helps sweep them away. This is why illness is so often associated with such awe-inspiring amounts of goop. Your second line of defense is your inflammatory response. The honchos here are specialized cells in your connective tissue called mast cells that constantly search for suspicious objects, usually unknown proteins, and then release signaling molecules like histamine when they find them. Histamine makes your blood vessels more permeable, which allows a whole bunch of fluid to flow to the affected area, and that is what causes inflammation. But it also brings in a crap ton of white blood cells, infection fighters, to go all balrog on whatever's trying to make its way in. This is great if you get a splinter in your toe or a bunch of viruses in your face, but sometimes something gets into you that's not actually dangerous, like pollen or dust or like a peanut, 
and your immune system triggers an inflammatory response anyway, even though it's not a big deal. This is what we call an allergic reaction, and you know what those are like with the swelling and the redness and the mucus production and the itching, and occasionally a little bit of death. So that is why we take antihistamines to suppress the histamine trigger so our immune system stops freaking out about nothing. Also, that is why you should always tell people when there are peanuts in your cookies. Most of the immune system activity that happens inside your body's fortress is done by white blood cells, or leukocytes. Leukocytes are awesome for a lot of reasons, but one reason is they've got full VIP access to anywhere in the body that they want to go, with the exception of the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord, which are, for obvious reasons, super high security areas. Leukocytes can move through the circulatory system, and when they get to a place where they're needed, they can basically send a signal to ask the capillary to open a gap between its cells, and then it oozes through that gap to the site of the infection. This is called, get ready for it, diapodesis from the Greek for oozing through. Now there are lots of different kinds of leukocytes, like different branches of your own personal microscopic army. The kind specific to the innate immune system are phagocytes, more Greek, this time phago meaning eating. And they're just any cells that ingest microorganisms through the process of phagocytosis. Phagocytes are pretty cool. They can literally chase down invading cells, grab them, and then completely engulf them. And some, like the superabundant neutrophils, move around the bloodstream and can quickly get to where the action is. Once a neutrophil kills an invading microbe, they basically just roll over and die. Dead neutrophils collect together into what we lovingly call pus. Now the biggest and baddest of the phagocytes are the macrophages, the big eaters, which don't generally travel a lot, but instead hang out like bodyguards in your various organs. Not only do they kill outside invaders, they can also detect when one of your cells has gone rogue, like a cancer cell, and kill those too. And they, unlike the neutrophils, don't die once they've killed a bacterium. They can eat up to a hundred before they die. The big eater. Of all the grisly stuff that goes on in the never-ending street war that is your immune system, some of the most gruesome stuff is done by a kind of cell called natural killer cells. Which reminds me, I think it's time for our very first open letter. An open letter to 1973. Dear 1973, you had a lot going on, the Vietnam War ending, Roe v. Wade, Watergate. It was a tumultuous time. But part of me wishes that you, 1973, had an opportunity to name everything in biology. Because you got one chance to name a new type of immune cell, and you named it the natural killer cell. And I freaking love that. I look around at today's script, with all of its dendritic cells and macrophages and diapa diseases, and I think, what if we let 1973 name all these things? Would we have spiky death cells and devourers and oozing action instead? I don't know. Maybe you would have screwed it up, but I don't think we could have done any worse than all this GD Greek we have to deal with all the time. Thanks for the Endangered Species Act, Hank. Okay, natural killer cells, more than just a great name, also the only phagocyte in the innate immune system that destroys other human cells. When your cells are healthy, they have a special protein on their surface called MHC1, MHC for major histocompatibility complex. But when your cells are infected, say with a virus, or when they're cancerous, they stop producing that protein. So the natural killers are always going around checking up on each of your cells, and when it finds one that's not normal, it pulls out its AK-47 and unloads. Actually, it just binds with it and then secretes an enzyme that dissolves its membrane, but still, killing. Finally, dendritic cells are a type of phagocyte that hangs out on the surface of much of your body that comes in contact with the environment, in your nose, on your skin, in your stomach and intestines. They eat up pathogens and then carry information about them back to the spleen or the lymph nodes where it passes intelligence about what's going on in the war front to the acquired immune system. I actually studied dendritic cells in my undergraduate thesis and I kind of fell in love with them. They're, they're lethal, but they're also intelligent. Great heroes for any Robert Ludlum novel. To be fair though, macrophages can do this too. The activity of these cells give us a chance to transfer from the innate immune system to the acquired immune system, which is going to make things a little more complicated. The acquired system has to learn as much as it can about every pathogen it interacts with, store that information, and then use it to invent defenses against them. It's your super elite Double Secret Strike Force Delta. You get to work building your acquired immune system immediately after you're born. Harvesting bacteria and other stuff, not just good bacteria that can help your guts out, but also harmful ones that your body learns from and stores information about. That system keeps an eye out for any foreign substance, a toxin, a virus, a bacteria, even parts of those things that could be telltale signs of a bad guy. We call those signs 
antigens, a word that comes from antibody generator. An antigen is anything that causes your immune system to ID a pathogen and then create an antibody against it. Now antibodies aren't cells, they're highly specialized proteins produced by B cells to recognize and help lay the smack down on intruders. But antibodies can't kill invaders themselves, they're just little proteins after all. The best that they can do by themselves is sort of just swarm all over the invader making it harder for it to move and to excrete toxins or otherwise infiltrate healthy cells. But more often antibodies serve as tags, attaching themselves to the scumbags and then releasing chemical signals to nearby phagocytes, alerting them that it's dinner time. Your acquired immune system also has its own type of white blood cells, not phagocytes, which go after everything that looks a little bit sketchy, but lymphocytes, which go after specific things that they already know about. There are two major types of lymphocytes, the T cells, which form in your bone marrow and then migrate and mature in the thymus gland right behind your breastbone, and the B cells, which originate and mature in the bone marrow. What T and B actually stand for is a long story, but if it helps you to remember, T's mature in the thymus, B's in the bone marrow. We have two different types of lymphocytes because our bodies have two different types of acquired immunity. The cell-mediated response, which is for when the cells are already infected, and the humoral response, for when the infection is just in the humors, the body's fluid, not in the cells. First, let's look at the cell-mediated response. This process mainly involves T cells, and there are quite a number of different types of them. Helper T cells have a cute sounding name, but in a lot of ways, they call the shots for the whole immune system. While they can't kill pathogens themselves, they activate and direct the cells that can. If 1973 had named them, they might have been called Admiral T cells or something more awesome. Helper T cells get their information from other immune cells that are out cracking skulls. Say, for instance, a macrophage finds a pathogen and destroys it. After the deed has been done, it has the ability to shred up the proteins from an invader and put a bit of that antigen on its membrane surface. This is called antigen presentation because the cell is presenting antigens. A helper T cell can detect when this happens and it comes over to attach itself to the presented antigen. The two cells talk to each other chemically. The antigen presenting cell produces a chemical called interleukin-1, which basically tells the helper T cell, uh, boss, I, uh, I found this guy over here and then I broke his neck and then he stuck his guts all over my cell wall. The helper T cell gives it a look and then releases a chemical called interleukin-2, which is like a bullhorn, an alarm that tells all the lymphocytes in the area, there are problems here! We've got a problem over here in sector 15! This alarm activates a couple different things all at once. First, the helper T cell starts making copies, tons of copies of itself. Most of those copies differentiate into effector T cells, which travel around secreting signaling proteins that stimulate other nearby lymphocytes to take action. Most of the rest of them become memory T cells. They're the ones that keep a record of the intruder and provide us with future immunity against it. And now for the saddest story of the day, what happens when a cell gets infected, so infected that it knows that it's a goner, that it in fact is being converted from a healthy useful part of the body to an evil zombie farm pumping out viruses or bacteria suddenly co-opted to help destroy everything it loves. Well, with its last bit of strength, it'll start presenting antigens, not asking to be rescued, but instead asking for a mercy killing. A cytotoxic T-cell has the job of granting that request. Once a cytotoxic T-cell gets the message from the helper T-cells that there is an infection to deal with, it starts patrolling the area for any normal cells presenting antigens. When it finds one, it latches onto it and releases enzymes that create holes in the cell's membrane and eventually breaks down the whole cell, killing the cell and the pathogen in the process. A human cell killing another human cell. And now, for the humoral response. The humoral response is designed to catch pathogens that are floating around in your body that haven't actually invaded any of your cells yet. The primary players are B cells, which are constantly patrolling your bloodstream like cops walking the beat until they get a signal from a helper T cell that something's wrong. B cells are covered in antibodies that can detect and bind to a specific antigen. A single B cell can be covered in a forest of up to 100,000 antibodies, say for the virus that causes the common cold. And the B cell next to it will have just as many receptors for a different antigen, for chickenpox or something. When a B cell bumps into a pathogen that it recognizes, it attaches to it and starts cloning itself like crazy. Suddenly there are tons of that B cell with the same receptor, but during the cloning process, the clones differentiate into new versions of the original just like the T cells did. Most turn into plasma or effector cells, which use the antibody as a blueprint to create a crap ton of antibodies for that specific pathogen, like 200 antibodies per second. Once these antibodies 
antibodies are released, they bind to the pathogens like crazy, marking them for death until the phagocyte can come along and do the dirty work. The rest of the cloned B cells mostly become memory cells, which have the same receptor, and stick around, providing future immunity from this invader. And we are now very out of time, but I really love this stuff, so I didn't want to gloss over anything. Mucus, natural killer cells, macrophages, killing things, breaking them up and sticking them on their cell membranes, effector cells spewing out antibodies and memory cells making sure that our immune systems hold that grudge. All because my absolute favorite thing to do every single day is not die. If you want to review anything we discussed in this episode, there's a table of contents over there. If you have any questions for us, we'll be down in the comments or on Facebook or Twitter, and we'll see you next time. Alright, so that is crash, crash Course in Immunology. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to show you a final summary here. Uh, this is a really nice diagram. Uh, it just sort of shows, if I can find my laser pointer, um, both sides of the acquired immune response. So there's a couple of things I just want you to see here. First on the humoral side, we get our antigen, uh, it comes along, attaches to the B cell, helper T cell comes along and says, yes, go B cell, and the B cell differentiates into plasma cells and memory cells. Um, so then again, on the cell mediated side, we get the antigen presenting cells, engulfing the antigens, and presenting them to cytotoxic T cells, which again are activated by helper T cells. So the helper T cells work on both the cytotoxic T cells and the B cells. So just remember the helper T cells are really central to regulating this whole process. And then the cytotoxic T cells go ahead and become active and differentiate into the active ones that are gonna poke holes in cell membranes and kill cells. And then the memory cytotoxic T cells, which are gonna be standing by ready for next time. So there you go. That is, in a nutshell, immunology. Any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you again next time.